In the 18th century, British merchants shipped around three million people from West Africa across the Atlantic to the Americas and sold them into slavery. They made four trillion pounds from the unpaid labor alone. Portugal and Holland pioneered this slave route. Britain made a national fortune from it. Much of the Britain we know today was built with slave money. Ports, cities and canals, even the Church of England has admitted making money from the slave business. By the 19th century, a fifth of the British elite had made their fortunes from slavery. Among them, David Cameron's distant cousin, General Sir James Duff. The Liverpool merchants who founded what's now Barclays Bank were slave traders. In 1833, when slavery was abolished, slave owners were paid 20 million pounds in compensation for their loss of property. That's two billion pounds today. More than 10 million people died as a direct result of the Atlantic slave trade. But the survivors got nothing. West Africa, nothing. <laughs> Now, 15 Caribbean states, including Jamaica, have launched the first united campaign for reparations from Britain, France and Holland. They have suggested compensation equal to the sum offered to slave owners in the 1830s, £2 billion. They also want an apology, Don't blush. recognition of the historic atrocity. They hid in caves. My great-grandmother was born in a cave to make sure that she was not born as a slave. And that is what Britain perpetuated. But the British government has refused to give either. David Cameron's first official visit to Jamaica has amplified calls on Britain to agree to reparations. Some argue that if Britain did pay, it wouldn't be the elite footing the bill but the tax-paying working classes. Others have said, this was 200 years ago, it's in the past, why should I pay now? In Jamaica, Slavery was followed with a century of colonialism. Most of the land is still in the hands of Europeans. When the Brits left in 1962, 80% of the population were functionally illiterate. Male literacy remains four points below the global average. 19% of the country live in poverty. When historic crimes have generational victims, who should pay? Our problems in all of these areas are legacies of the slave experience. Now I know it is fashionable in Barbados whenever you start to talk about slavery for the purists to ask, but why are you going so far back? That was finished long ago. Now the same people who ask that question go to church on Sundays and the priest talks about Adam and Eve and they don't think he's going too far back. He talks about Hezekiah, they don't think he's going too far back. He talks about Daniel in the lion's den, that's not too far back. And they could go on. Ahab and Jezebel, not too far back. But if you talk about slavery just 150 years ago, you say you're going too far back. The stage has been reached where we have to settle this issue. Now let's be very frank about it. European nations, slave owning nations have been doing their best according to their likes to contribute to our developmental efforts in the Caribbean. Um, we've enjoyed preferences on European markets. We, we have had in our trade and arrangements, for example, we've had four Lomé conventions and we've had uh, a Cotonou uh, agreement and now we're into an economic partnership agreement and so on. And we get aid out of the European, European Development Fund and so on. And we have got various forms of technical assistance and that kind of thing. So, so we, we're not here talking about a diplomacy of anger and protest. What we're saying is that upwards of 200 years after the abolition of the slave trade and just under 
uh, 200 years after the emancipation of slaves themselves, we are still chronically underdeveloped. We are still facing huge challenges. And we are still, in fact, no, we are still, we are now crushed by debt. We are now overwhelmed by deficit. We are facing educational challenges, health challenges. And in many respects, we are, we are facing challenges of normlessness. We have sections of our societies that do not feel any effective part of the mainstream of the society. We are dealing here with a legacy. The Arvis Centenarian in Barbados today, that centenarian's grandmother, our great-grandmother was a slave. So it's not too far away. And we're saying that this thing has left some scars and we want to talk about it. This is not a diplomacy of protest. It's a diplomacy of engagement. And the CARICOM Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations is taking the view that what we need to do is to engage those European nations most obviously involved in slavery and the slave trade as it affected the Caribbean to see what agreements we can reach in terms of how they can enhance the effort they're making in our societies so that we can be rid of some of the asymmetry, some of the disequilibrium social and economic that have been afflicting our societies uh, since emancipation. We don't expect, because we're not that stereotype, that these nations are going to jump up and shout, mea culpa. They're not going to say, we plead guilty, What's the sentence? No, no, that's not going to happen. We expect that this is something we have to work through. We're not working through it in anger. We're working through it in a civilized way because we have good relations with these nations. Barbados is the principal source market for tourism in the um, United Kingdom. We have a good diplomatic relationship with the Kingdom of Spain. We have excellent relations with, with, with the Netherlands. Uh, we have a good relationship with France, even though from time to time uh, France labels us as, a, as a, 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 a tax haven for offshore purposes, but we understand that. These are the little skirmishes that you have to endure in international relations. The demand by CARICOM governments, that is to say governments of the Caribbean community, including St. Vincent and the Grenadines, for reparations is a very clear and cogent demand. The case for reparations is in fact unanswerably strong. Reparations is for native genocide and African slavery. The European nations carried out large-scale genocide of the indigenous peoples and of course the enslaved African bodies. There ought to be and justice demands an appropriate recompense. In the case of St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 1763 when the British assumed suzerainty of our country there were 9,000 indigenous persons 
the Kalinagos, the so-called yellow caribs, and the Garifuna, the so-called black caribs. And the British fought them for their lands, and over a period of 30 odd years, decimated the population to less than 50% of the original number, and then deported a significant number of them to an offshore island called Baliso, and then 2,000 and something of them who survived were exiled to Rattan Island in the Bay of Honduras. The descendants of the Garifuna are now in several Central American countries, particularly Belize and Honduras, but also including Guatemala and Nicaragua, and of course there in the United States of America and other parts of the world, and they see St. Vincent and Grenadines as their spiritual home. So one understands St. Vincent and the Grenadines pushing the case for reparations for native genocide. And of course, there was organized enslavement of African bodies throughout the Caribbean over several centuries. And the genocide and the enslavement has, uh, have caused a legacy of underdevelopment. Underdevelopment in respect of education, health, housing, living standards, infrastructure for roads, um, the question of psychological damage, breakup of family life, the, the, the social and economic and, and governance consequences have been horrendous. And the European nations have to work with us, and that's what we are demanding, to repair the legacy of underdevelopment caused by native genocide and African slavery. This is not a demand for monies to be parceled out individually by European governments to present the descendants of native peoples and also African slaves. No, it is a question of correcting, repairing the legacies of underdevelopment caused by native genocide and African slavery. And the Caribbean Community CARICOM has established a Regional Reparations Commission, the Caribbean Re Re Reparations Commission, and individual countries have set up their own national reparation commissions. And a lot of work is being done. Um, there was a conference which was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. People from all over the world on the subject, subsequently in Antigua, and we have been moving worldwide in carrying our message. And CARICOM has adopted a 10-point plan covering economic issues, educational issues, health issues, psychological, social issues, cultural issues, matters of, of um, historical memory and, and uh, monuments and the like. A total package regarding the repairing of this legacy of underdevelopment, including that package too is for consideration for work to be done by ourselves in the Caribbean and Europe and African countries for those persons, particularly Rastafari brethren and sisters, who may wish to return to Africa and settle. The majority of African Guyanese in fact, the majority of Africans in the Caribbean are the descendants of victims of the transat transatlantic trade in captive Africans. That trade was the largest forced transportation of human beings from one part of the globe to another in the whole history of the world. And it is one of the greatest unnatural disasters of all time. The transatlantic trade in captive Africans involved the systematic capture, transportation, sale, and enslavement of human beings. The 
trade started in 1441. I know some of my friends celebrated from 1492, but I'm afraid the evidence is overwhelming. It started in 1441. So there have been over 400 years of the transatlantic trade until it was brought to an end. And it involved four continents. Africa, of course, Europe, North America, and South America. The enslavement of Africans was a crime against humanity. As we know, the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance held in Durban, South Africa from August the 31st to September the 8th, 2001, acknowledge, and I quote, the slavery and the slave trade are a crime against humanity and should always have been so. My brothers and sisters, there was a crime, but there's been no punishment. There's been a crime, but there's been no justice. The enslavement of Africans, the decimation of the indigenous population on this continent and in the Caribbean, and the oppression of indentured immigrants all constituted crimes. And therefore, the call for what I call reparative justice, that is reparations, is entirely correct, is entirely in order. Reparative justice concerns the legal obligation of states. It is not something notional, it's legal. States have a legal duty to acknowledge and address widespread or systematic human rights violations in cases where the state caused the violations or in cases where the state did not seriously try to prevent them. Reparations publicly affirm that victims have rights and are entitled to redress. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, the descendants of the colonized people of the Caribbean, therefore, are correct in their call for reparative justice. The victims of these crimes against humanity have been deprived of an apology. They have been deprived of reparative justice for the abominable crimes that resulted in the loss of millions of lives, the expropriation of wealth and property, and the legacy of underdevelopment, which still besets us all in the Caribbean and Guyana. As everybody knows, I have retired from public office. And there are those who monitor my movements very carefully. And when I told them I was coming to Antigua, they said, not cricket again. <laughs> I said, no, I was coming for a conference on reparations. And I was astonished at the reaction of several people pretty close to me. Why are you wasting your time? This will come to nothing. And the core of what I have to say today is intended to convey to you the imperative that something must come of our efforts. Some people regard it as a deliberate distraction by political leaders to get away from what they regard as 
the real issues of the day. Crime, IMF conditionalities, unemployment, and we have a duty to make people understand that as we seek to address those problems, we must first of all begin by knowing who we are. Where are we coming from? Where are we today? And where do we want to go tomorrow? And yesterday, I tried to deal with one of the spurious reasons being advanced while there is no obligation on the European capitals to respond to the 10-point demand. Let me deal at the outset with another. The 10-point plan does not include any specific amount which is to be claimed by way of reparations. Most of you regard me as a person who has held political office. I also happen to be a lawyer by training. And when somebody has committed a crime, you don't begin by saying, if the person can't pay, it is not worth convicting that person for the crime. It is the case that the conviction comes first and the civil remedies will follow thereafter. I want to commend the present leadership of CARICOM for having taken the bold decision to establish this commission and to applaud the regional committee for wasting no time on getting on with the business before you. In a very short time, you have already begun to make your impact felt. But if we are honest with ourselves, we must realize we have a far way to go in the campaign which is necessary to make the people who belong to the community and the people who have been adversely affected recognize the duty to pursue the course of justice in dealing with what is the most heinous crime against humanity in all the history of the human race. When I got to Harvard Law School, I was 26 years old. It was the first time I had ever sat in a classroom next to a white American. And I remembered being impressed about how wealthy the school was. Harvard is the oldest university in America, established in 1636. And it has become extraordinarily rich. 
It has an endowment now in excess of $20 billion. And I recall sitting in class, poor child from the South, seeing these oil paintings above the wainscoted rich hardwood rooms of old bewigged white men from the 17th and 18th century. And one was awed by it. This is Harvard. Thirty years would go by before I was to learn that Harvard Law School was established and made possible by a man named Isaac Royale, who endowed the law school from the proceeds he had gotten from the sale of slaves on his Antiguan sugar plantation. Our forebears with their appropriated labor endowed Harvard Law School. Admittedly, Jamaica was the Caribbean's largest slave market. The British imported into Jamaica 1.3 million Africans. At the end of slavery in 1838, there were 300,000 remaining. The question has to be asked then, how do you reduce 1.3 million people to 300,000 after 200 years? Less than 25% survival. Slavery in Jamaica was genocidal. We understand then that when we speak of slavery in the context of Jamaica and the aftermath of Mr. Cameron's speech, we are speaking also about the genocide on that island. Three months earlier, the French president, Mr. Hollande, had also visited a Caribbean colony in Guadeloupe. He too said there will be no apology for slavery and there will be no reparations. But he was in Guadeloupe to open a multi-million euro museum dedicated to slavery as a gift from the people of France so that the African community and the French islands could see the horror of slavery displayed in their museum. He went on to add that France owes the people of the Caribbean a debt of gratitude. But this gratitude would not be expressed in either an apology or in any form of reparatory justice. All of this came against the background of what had transpired in 2001 when President Aristide of Haiti demanded the return of the 150 million francs that France had insisted that Haiti pay for their own self-liberation. Uh, you may recall that uh, Haiti had fought a war of liberation, uh, declared their independence on the 1st of January 1804. Uh, the Haitians were the first uh, people on this planet to give Napoleon Bonaparte a whooping. And in return for this whipping, uh, France insists that if the Haitians wish to be recognized as an independent nation state, they will have to pay compensation to their former enslavers. Uh, 1825, the Haitians are celebrating the 21st anniversary of their independence. France had refused to recognize Haiti as an independent nation. All the slave-owning nations of the Western world, Britain, Spain, Portugal, Holland, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, the United States, all said they will not recognize Haiti 
until the French recognized Haiti. The French said, if you want recognition, you pay for it. The Haitian people in 1825 had therefore a decision to make on their 21st anniversary. There were parties in Port-au-Prince, but there were also French gunboats in the harbor. The Haitian cabinet met and agreed that they wished to be reinserted into the international community, and this reinsertion would cost them 150 million francs, which is 21 billion US dollars in contemporary money. This money was paid, agreed to be paid, and was paid to the French government over 100 years. This extraction of economic value out of Haiti in the first 100 years of its nationhood crippled that nation. In some years in the 19th century, the payment to France in reparations accounted for 60 to 70 percent of the foreign exchange earnings of that nation. Aristide acts for the return of this money to the people of Haiti. He wrote to the French government, government to government, calling for the return of this money. The French government invaded Haiti, Aristide was overthrown and removed from office. His successor, his first public statement, was that the claim for reparations and the repayment of this money was a criminal act and removed from the state. And therein was the end of that conversation. President Aristide had acted against the background of the UN conference in Durban in South Africa on race, xenophobia, and related intolerances. The American government under Bush had pulled out of this conference on the basis that any discussions around slavery and reparations were internal national issues and not to be ventilated in international fora. President Clinton had earlier expressed a statement of regret on behalf of the American state, but had also refused to apologize. President Obama followed the Bush-Clinton line and also indicated that there is no need for a formal apology. President Holland did state in Guadeloupe that history cannot be the subject of financial transactions. President Obama declared that the discourse on repara reparations and reparatory justice is divisive of the nation state. The Western world, therefore, seems united in its opposition to the concept of preparatory justice for the people of Africa. And so there seems to be a Euro-American alliance that stands in solidarity in opposition to justice for the enslaved peoples of the modern Western world. The call for reparations represents a commitment to enter a constructive dialogue on the role of slavery and racism in shaping present-day conditions on our community and American society. H.R. 40 is designed to broaden the effort to educate the public by establishing a national commission to examine the institution of slavery. The commission would study the impact of slavery and continuing discrimination against African Americans, resulting directly uh, and indirectly from the period of enslavement during the apartheid of reconstruction, desegregation, and the present day. The Commission would also make recommendations concerning any form of apology and compensation to begin the long-delayed process of atonement. And when I use the term compensation, I do not mean money. I'm not talking about dollars and cents. While at 
commission will not erase the past. It can bring us closer to racial reconciliation and advancement. A commission would not only examine the institution of slavery, but the legacy of slavery that weighs so heavily uh, on, uh, on all of us, really, in this country. Anyone watching the civic protests in Ferguson can understand that while the shooting of Michael Brown was, of course, tragic, it is a part of a deeper problem facing our community. This reality is the result of the social, economic, and political disenfranchisement of, that people of color have endured throughout our experience in this country. And I look forward to this, today's discussion as being important so that we may identify a strategy or several that will bring us closer to the enactment of H.R. 40. While the rollback of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, a historic piece of civil rights legislation, I believe this conversation is even more relevant now than it ever was. I speak as a descendant of captured African ancestors. I am not uncertain about my personal connection to them. The identity of one enslaved ancestor, Alexander Mighty, born 1829, wow. age six at the time of emancipation. And I honor Alexander Mighty today. As a result of today's scientific possibilities, I know that others to whom I'm connected were captured from the country given the name Cameroon, placed in chains, enslaved and shipped across the Atlantic to the island given the name Jamaica. An island settled by the Tainos, an island stolen from the Tainos by the Spaniards, and then by the English in 1655. An island that, like the others in the Americas, were all captured lands in Reggae Singer Chronics' artistic proclamation, but also an island where its people have always maintained a liberation ideology and demonstrated an uncompromising opposition to systems of domination, even if they suffer in the process. Today, we in the Caribbean, the region I represent today, may have political independence, but pro-colonialism is squeezing our throats so tightly that at times we cannot breathe. Yes. African people are still walking in a circle, so vividly represented in 2015 Man Booker Prize winner Marlon James's historical novel, The Book of Night Women. He says, every nigger walks in a circle, Take that and make it what you will. A circle like a sun, a circle like a moon, a circle like bad tidings that seem gone, but always comes back, mm -hmm. end of quote. Mm -hmm. That is why we are in the movement, carrying the load of our ancestors. <coughs> now, a few years ago, on one of my trips to this country, I came across an article in the American Way magazine titled More Than Remembering. It was by Navy Seal Clint Bruce, who introduced readers to an alternative strategy for, for your annual Memorial Day. For him, Memorial Day is not only a holiday, but a day that conjures up memories of sacrifice and loss, an opportunity to honor and commemorate. He explained how some years ago, as he struggled to deal with mixed emotions on Memorial Day, he decided to strap on a backpack and just start walking, or more accurately, marching out of respect for those who had either given or dedicated their lives for the public good. On his march, he encountered a veteran who asked him, son, who are you carrying? In that moment, his project, Carry the Load, was born. Carry the Load, founded by Bruce and Stephen Holly, is a nonprofit organization based in Dallas that seeks to restore the true meaning of Memorial Day, urging Americans to do something to honor those who have sacrificed for this country. hundred and forty six years of legal slavery where the headquarters was Montgomery Alabama slaveocracy and Wall Street was in fact the trading place. Wall Street was a deeply involved if not more so than the South. They planted and picked it in the South and they sold it in New York. 
It was the global trade that drove the end of slavery, at least from the American frame of reference. Now the fact is America is the last train on the slave train. We think we're the first because we've been Americanized. But the fact is it came to, to Brazil and the Caribbean before it got here. And therefore some of them started earlier than 1619 and, and, and got out earlier than we did and fought fights like they did in Haiti and got out. But as America framework, 246 years in, in slavery. This is not a, a new subject about repair for, for damage done. It's not a new subject, 246, and that was this war where we fought to salvage the Union and censored to save to end slavery. Problem was, Jeremiah, we left the slave masters in charge of implementing abolition. We, we left the slave masters in charge of implementing abolition. And so we got the right to vote in 1870, but, but it was not implemented until 1965, 95 years later. And that's because when they removed the troops, they removed the capacity to protect the newly a promised freedom that we were to have. Uh, the big mistake made in 1865 was we left the troops in charge, of, they left the, the slave mass in charge of the system. In 1965, made the same mistake, we left the segregations in charge of it, and they got it now. I was paying last, two weeks ago, we went in, into Selma. Uh, what should have been a giant celebration was a, was a celebration. Should have been a big demonstration. Because the 65 Voting Rights Act has been nullified by the 2013 Voting Rights Act. 1965, blacks could not vote, and white women could not sit on juries, 18 year olds could not vote, couldn't vote by language, couldn't vote on college campuses. We won that, but we had Section 4 and 5 to protect this way, the protected right to vote. This court, led by Clarence Thomas, I say led by him because the court voted five to four to remove section four, to remove the oversight, and Clarence Summers said they should have removed section four and five. He said it wasn't extreme enough. He tried to take us back to 1896. He took us back almost to pre-1954 because now from Virginia around to Texas, every southern state is now going confederate again. And so we can vote, but it's diminished because we're locked in the back of legislatures. We have almost no power. And so on that stage sat a governor who uh, collected $120 million from the Department of Education and spent all of it on, um, all of it on, on prison reform and was not charged with misappropriation of money. On that stage, the governor turned down $10 billion in Medicaid. Was a governor who drives up a state with 240,000 folks have lost the right to vote because they've been to prison. 180,000 of them are African American. He sat down honored on the occasion of celebration and should have been demonstrating against him. He is in Wallace's lineage and legacy. Yet our lack of lack of appreciation of our history uh, that makes us ignore the impact of ethnic cleansing on our minds. Folks who have taken this situation more seriously have sought some measure of reparations. The call today for reparatory justice for Afro-descendants is an imperative for expanded democracy and spiritual and material well-being. It is a test case for human de de decency that conforms to the accepted standards of morality. The call for reparatory justice is a marker of the outstanding balance on atonement, of adjudication, adjudicating our past wrongs against fellow citizens who continue to be shut out, marginalized, and discriminated against. The negative consequences of in, 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 inattention or of insufficient attention to the legitimate demands of Afro-descendants in all of our societies for official national apologies for recognition of enslavement of Africans as historically significant crime against humanity requires emotional, psychological, 
and material repair and reflection. The case of repair toward justice must be formulated and implemented in collaboration with Afro descendants as they implemented, as they, as, as, excuse me, with Afro, Af, with Afro descendants as they proactively envision and construct their futures as full citizens with both self-interest and common interest with other citizens, not as immobilized, pitiful victims. Official recognition by public policymakers of the, or the, of the absence or inadequacy of policies to overcome inhumane negative racialization characterizes in which most Afro descendants live today is a major step towards positive public ownership, not guilt for the past. It is. Um, the truth is that um, we are not arguing specifically that vast sums of money need to be paid. The proposition before this house is the principle of owing reparations, not the fine points of how much is owed, to whom it should be paid. The question is, is there a debt? Does Britain owe reparations? As far as I'm concerned, the ability to acknowledge a wrong that has been done, to simply say sorry, will go a far, far, far longer way than some percentage of GDP in, 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 form, in the form of, of, of aid. What is required, it seems to me, is accepting the principle that reparations are owed. Personally, I'd be quite happy if it was one pound a year for the next 200 years after the last 200 years of Britain and India. Thank you very much, Madam President. Happy that after 95 years I know that it is not dying like me oh, moving yeah. forward. <laughs> when I see representatives as far and distant as my brothers, the Rastafara here, who we do not know much about, but who are perhaps the only significant people in the Caribbean that have been consistently Afrocentric despite the changes that have tried to be made there. They have been consistently Afrocentric. From then on to what we see today, these people, when I hear the encouragement from the ambassador from Kenya and give the example of what Kenya has done to the world, and how she can be an example of movement. How she has moved from the beginning and the 40 years that she has been. When I can think of he speaks about the freedom movement in Kenya. I can think of Jomo Kenyatta, whom I saw in prison, whom I represented, and who came out of it a fighter to fight for the same thing that we are fighting for today. When I can see the representative, the son of Marcus Garvey, who is who's here. Marcus Garvey, who is seminal. When I see all these things, I know that we have a movement. When I hear that from the recent speaker, the mayor, that we must form a lobby to carry this movement through to the United Nations and to the African Union and so on. Carry a lobby. We are a lobby, but we are a lobby to prevent, to, to, to prepare for the type of democracy that we are going to produce. Not lobbies like we have today in the lobbyist part of the democracy that speaks about it. Not that type of lobbyist that has its powers in other places. We are a united, concerted body of lobbyists for the Af African. You see, we begin by knowing that each of us here, wherever we are, whatever is your nationality, we are sons of the one motherland Africa. Yeah. That is the beginning. <laughs> whether you are from Barbados, whether you are from uh, wherever you are from, remember this, you know, your ancestors didn't have passports when they were torn from the parts right. of Africa. They didn't have any nationality right. papers. Right. They were always just slaves, just slaves, just black African slaves. You cannot change your ethnicity, you can change your domesticity. 
you can change your domicile, you can change your nationalism, but you will always be your father's son. Mm. You have never changed that ethnicity. I consider myself and all of us here That's right. as many of us who are, we are all from the Astra, then you are really non-resident Africans wherever you are. Mm -hmm. That's the beginning. We are non-resident Africans. We begin from there and then we look at the possibilities that we have. I've heard about what, yeah, where we must move. I'm going to make this very, very short. Because the speakers before you have shown the way, have shown you what we have to do. We have to do. If you are a Pan-Africanist, you've got a mission. We have to understand the Pan-African vision. The vision made clearly by men like Marcus Garvey, who said, look, you can become what you are. You are sons of Africa. The man who spoke about black nationalism for the first time and put it in our hearts. When we listen to that philosophy and we carry it out, that is our guide. Marcus Garvey is a guide. He's shown us the compass of our, our direction. And if you follow that, you can't go wrong. When you do something, you will figure, is this in the best interest of Africa? That's right. That's if it's in the best interest of Africa, then it is right, you That's can go ahead. Right. Right. That is the question that you ask yourself. I may really say thanks to God that after nine to five years, I see both the youth and the not so young people here who are met together to show that there is a continuous thread, a continuous thread that goes right through and we must move it on. I thank you all for being here. You give me strength in my old age. I thank you. This is a people's open parliamentary session on African reparations. Parliament may be closed, but we define the terms of our gathering. We call it what we like and we talk about what we like because we are responsible for our own self-repair. They call me Namibia. As we are speaking now, our brothers and sisters back home are also having a similar gathering in solidarity of this one. personal violence between persons of African heritage are not isolated manifestations. We must read into personal violence against men, women, children and young people of African heritage as part of the continuum of the state's racialized, gendered, sexualized violence against African heritage communities. Is about showing the state's complicity in ongoing intra-community violence which in itself is a ground for reparatory justice for those living today. Reparation can be in different ways. It can be monetarily, it can be restoring dignity, it can be providing education, it can come in several forms. But the ethos behind it is to restore the aggrieved party to an original position. Those people in the, the Black Democratic Caucus in the United States are saying that if we were to pay monetarily back for the damage of 500 years of slavery and 20 million black people, that it would cost anywhere from two to four trillion dollars and that every African American is owed 142,000 US per person. If you think about the intergenerational trauma and you had that into it. But what we are asking for is fair access to justice, fair access to education, psychological therapies for single mothers who have got it hard in the diaspora. Symbolically, people from the African diaspora have been 
without citizenship. So say for example, my name is Donovan Reynolds and I'm black. I don't know where that name come from. But I've sort of looked at my ancestry and realized that I come from Ghana. Yet I haven't got access to live in Ghana. So I'm living without citizenship. And under international law, people have got a right to citizenship. Today is a starting point. And every year, we're gonna march here because we need our dignity to be restored as black people from the diaspora. Thank you. Can you explain to the Daily Politics blog the whole concept of intergenerational trauma and how it affects us as people in the African diaspora? The notion of intergenerational trauma is actually something that all groups who experience massive violations and human rights violations, humanitarian rights violations, assaults to their dignity. So one of the famous cases is the Jewish people, um, Aboriginal people of Australia, Indigenous peoples of the America. All of these groups have their own experts who have been able to establish how descendants of people that went through the original trauma continue to be affected three, four, five, six, seven generations on. When you have a massive group trauma, mm -hmm. and in African people's case, we're talking about one that is continuing mm -hmm. in terms of neo-colonial mm -hmm. forms of enslavement. Mm -hmm. If there is no recognition for the, the victims, no recognition about what we have been through, and we are just expected to pull ourselves by the bootstraps, then that causes harm because really there's a secondary victimization in that for African people there isn't even a recognition that we are going through any Ma'angamizi or Holocaust. Unlike other groups. Unlike the, the sort of people who have got reparation. Unlike the Jews some have other, got reparation. Unlike some other groups who have had forms of redress. Mm -hmm. And so the African case is different because we were the first people that help our bloodlines run through our all human groups. And so you will find people of African heritage wherever we are on the planet.